the happy hypocrite a fairy tale for tired men by max beerbohm chapter one none it is said of all who revelled with the regent was half so wicked as lord george hell i will not trouble my little readers with a long recital of his great naughtiness but it were well they should know that he was greedy destructive and disobedient i am afraid there is no doubt that he often sat up at carleton house until long after bedtime playing games and that he generally ate and drank far more than was good for him his fondness for fine clothes was such that he used to dress on weekdays quite as gorgeously as good people dress on sundays he was thirty-five years old and a great grief to his parents and the worst of it was that he set such a bad example to others never never did he try to conceal his wrong-doing so that in time every one knew how horrid he was in fact i think he was proud of being horrid captain tarleton in his account of a contemporary bucks suggested that his lordship's great candour was a virtue and should incline us to forgive some of his abominable faults but painful as it is to me to dissent from any opinion expressed by one who is now dead i hold that candour is good only when it reveals good actions or good sentiments and that when it reveals evil itself is evil even also lord george held did at last atone for all his faults in a way that was never revealed to the world during his lifetime the reason of his strange and sudden disappearance from that social sphere in which he had so long moved and never moved again i will unfold my little readers will then i think acknowledge that any angry judgment they may have passed upon him must be reconsidered and maybe withdrawn i will leave his lordship in their hands but my plea for him will not be based upon that candour of his which some of his friends so much admired there were yes some so weak and so wayward as to think it a fine thing to have an historic title and no scruples here comes george hell they would say how wicked my lord is looking noblesse oblige you see and so an aristocrat should be very careful of his good name anonymous naughtiness does little harm it is pleasant to record that many persons were in obnoxious to the magic of his title and disapproved of him so strongly that whenever he entered a room where they happened to be they would make straight for the door and watch him very severely through the keyhole every morning when he strolled up piccadilly they crossed over to the other side in a compact body leaving him to the companionship of his bad companions on that which is still called the shady side lord george uh, greek chetilius was uh, quite indifferent to this demonstration indeed he seemed wholly hardened and when ladies gathered up their skirts as they passed him he would lightly appraise their ankles i am glad i never saw his lordship they say he was rather like caligula with a dash of sir john falstaff and that sometimes on wintry mornings in st james street young children would hush their prattle and cling in disconsolate terror to their nurses skirts as they saw him come that vast and fearful gentleman with the east wind ruffling the rotund surface of his beaver ruffling the fur about his neck and wrists and striking the purple complexion of his cheeks to a still deeper purple king bogey they called him in the nurseries in the hours when they too were naughty their nurses would predict his advent down the chimney or from the linen press and then they always behaved so that you see even the unrighteous are a power for good in the hands of nurses it is true that his lordship was a non-smoker a negative virtue certainly and due even that i fear to the fashion of the day but there the list of his good qualities comes to an abrupt conclusion he loved with an insatiable love the town and the pleasures of the town whilst the ennobling influences of our english lakes were quite unknown to him 
he used to boast that he had not seen a buttercup for twenty years and once he called the country a fool's paradise london was the only place marked on the map of his mind london gave him all he wished for is it not extraordinary to think that he had never spent a happy day nor a day of any kind in follard chase that desirable mansion in hertz which he had won from sir follard follard by a chuck of the dice at boodle's on his seventeenth birthday always cynical and unkind he had refused to give the broken baronet his revenge always unkind and insolent he had offered to install him in the lodge an offer which was after a little hesitation accepted on my soul the man's place is a sinecure lord george would say he never has to open the gate to me so rust has covered the great iron gates of follard chase and moss had covered its paths the deer browsed upon its terraces there were only wild flowers anywhere deep down among the weeds and water-lilies of the little stone-rimmed pond he had looked down upon lay the marble fawn as he had fallen of all the sins of his lordship's life surely not one was more wanton than his neglect of follard chase some whispered nor did he ever trouble to deny that he had won it by foul means by loaded dice indeed no card-player in st james's cheated more persistently than he as he was rich and had no wife and family to support and as his luck was always capital i can offer no excuse for his conduct at carleton house in the presence of many bishops and cabinet ministers he once dunned the regent most arrogantly for five thousand guineas out of which he had cheated him some months before and went so far as to declare that he would not leave the house till he got it whereupon his royal highness with that unfailing tact for which he was ever famous invited him to stay there as a guest which in fact lord george did for several months after this we can hardly be surprised when we read that he seldom sat down to the fashionable game of limbo with less than four and sometimes with as many as seven aces up his sleeve we can only wonder that he was tolerated at all at garble's that nightly resort of titled rips and roisterers he usually spent the early hours of his evenings round the illuminated garden with la gambogi the dancer on his arm and a bacchic retinue at his heels he would amble leisurely clad in georgian costume which was not then of course fancy dress as it is now now and again in the midst of his noisy talk he would crack a joke of the period or break into a sentimental ballad dance a little or pick a quarrel when he tired of such fooling he would proceed to his box in the tiny alfresco theatre and patronize the jugglers pugilists play-actors and whatever eccentric persons happened to be performing there the stars were splendid and the moon as beautiful as a great camellia one night in may as his lordship laid his arms upon the cushioned ledge of his box and watched the antics of the merry dwarf a little curly-headed creature whose debut it was certainly garble had found a novelty lord george led the applause and the dwarf finished his frisking with a pretty song about lovers nor was this all feats of archery were to follow in a moment the dwarf reappeared with a small gilded bow in his hand and a quiver full of arrows slung at his shoulder hither and thither he shot these vibrant arrows very precisely several into the bark of the acacias that grew about the overt stage several into the fluted columns of the boxes two or three to the stars the audience was delighted bravo bravo sagittaro murmured lord george in the language of la gambogi who was at his side finally the waxen figure of a man was carried on by an assistant and propped against the trunk of a tree a scarf was tied across the eyes of the merry dwarf who stood in a remote corner of the stage bravo indeed for the shaft had pierced the waxen figure through the heart 
or just where the heart would have been if the figure had been human and not waxen lord george called for port and champagne and beckoned the bowing homuncule to his box that he might compliment him on his skill and pledge him in a bumper of the grape on my soul you have a genius for the bow his lordship cried with florid condescension come and sit by me but first let me present you to my divine companion the signora gambogi virgo et sagittarius egad you may have met on the zodiac indeed i met the signora many years ago the dwarf replied with a low bow but not on the zodiac and the signora perhaps forgets me at this speech the signora flushed angrily for she was indeed no longer young and the dwarf had a childish face she thought he mocked her her eyes flashed lord george's twinkled rather maliciously great is the experience of youth he laughed pray are you stricken with more than twenty summers with more than i can count said the dwarf to the health of your lordship and he drained his long glass of wine lord george replenished it and asked by what means or miracle he had acquired his mastery of the bow by long practice the little thing rejoined a long practice on human creatures and he nodded his curls mysteriously on my heart you are a dangerous box-mate your lordship were certainly a good target little liking this joke at his bulk which really rivalled the regent's lord george turned brusquely in his chair and fixed his eyes upon the stage this time it was the gambogi who laughed a new operetta the fair captive of sambercand was being enacted and the frequenters of garbles were all curious to behold the debutant jenny Meer, who was said to be both pretty and talented these predictions were surely fulfilled when the captive peeped from the window of her wooden turret she looked so pale under her blue turban her eyes were dark with fear her parted lips did not seem capable of speech is it that she is frightened of us the audience wondered or of the flashing scimitar of afashes the cruel father who holds her captive so they gave her loud applause and when at length she jumped down to be caught in the arms of her gallant lover nisra and throwing aside her eastern draperies did a simple dance in the convention of columbine their delight was quite unbounded she was very young and did not dance very well it is true but they forgave her that and when she turned in the dance and saw her father with his scimitar their hearts beat swiftly for her nor were all eyes tearless when she pleaded with him for her life strangely absorbed quite callous of his two companions lord george gazed over the footlights he seemed as one who is in a trance of a sudden something shot sharp into his heart in pain he sprang to his feet and as he turned he seemed to see a winged and laughing child in whose hand was a bow fly swiftly away into the darkness at his side was the dwarf's chair it was empty only la gambogi was with him and her dark face was like the face of a fury presently he sank back into his chair holding one hand to his heart that still throbbed from the strange transfixion he breathed very painfully and seemed scarce conscious of his surroundings but la gambogi knew he would pay no more homage to her now for that the love of jenny Meer had come into his heart when the operetta was over his love-sick lordship snatched up his cloak and went away without one word to the lady at his side rudely he brushed aside count karoloff and mr fitzclarence with whom he had arranged to play hazard of his comrades his cynicism his reckless scorn of all the material of his existence he was oblivious now he had no time for penitence or diffident delay he only knew that he must kneel at the feet of jenny Meer and ask her to be his wife miss Meer said garble is in her room resuming her ordinary attire 
if your lordship deign to wait the conclusion of her humble toilette it shall be my privilege to present her to your lordship even now indeed i hear her footfall on the stair lord george uncovered his head and with one hand nervously smoothed his rebellious wig miss mere come hither said garble this is my lord george hell that you have pleased whom by your poor efforts this night will ever be in the prime gratification of your passage through the roseate realms of art little miss mere who had never seen a lord except in fancy or in dreams curtsied shyly and hung her head with a loud crash lord george fell on his knees the manager was greatly surprised the girl greatly embarrassed yet neither of them laughed for sincerity dignified his posture and sent eloquence from its lips miss mere he cried give ear i pray you to my poor words nor spurn me in miss prisian from the pedestal of your beauty genius and virtue all too conscious alas of my presumption in the same i yet abase myself before you as a suitor for your adorable hand i grope under the shadow of your raven locks i am dazzled in the light of those translucent orbs your eyes in the intolerable whirlwind of your fame i faint and am afraid sir the girl began simply say my lord said garble solemnly my lord i thank you for your words they are beautiful but indeed indeed i can never be your bride lord george hid his face in his hands child said mr garble let not the sun rise ere you have retracted those wicked words my wealth my rank my irremeable love for you i throw them at your feet lord george cried piteously i would wait an hour a week a lustre even a decade did you but bid me hope i can never be your wife she said slowly i can never be the wife of any man whose face is not saintly your face my lord mirrors it may be true love for me but it is even as a mirror long tarnished by the reflection of this world's vanity it is even as a tarnished mirror do not kneel to me for i am poor and humble i was not made for such impetuous wooing kneel if you please to some greater gayer lady as for my love it is my own nor can it be ever torn from me but given as true love must needs be given freely ah rise from your knees that man whose face is wonderful as are the faces of the saints to him i will give my true love miss mere though visibly affected had spoken this speech with a gesture and elocution so superb that mr garble could not help applauding deeply though he regretted her attitude towards his honoured patron as for lord george he was immobile as a stricken oak with a sweet look of pity miss mere went her way and mr garble with some solicitude helped his lordship to rise from his knees out into the night without a word his lordship went above him the stars were still splendid they seemed to mock the festoons of little lamps dim now and guttering in the garden of garbles what should he do no thoughts came only his heart burnt hotly he stood on the brim of garbles lake shallow and artificial as his past life had been two swans slept on its surface the moon shone strangely upon their white twisted necks should he drown himself there was no one in the garden to prevent him and in the morning they would find him floating there one of the noblest of love's victims the garden would be closed in the evening there would be no performance in the little theatre it might be that jenny mere would mourn him life is a prison without bars he murmured as he walked away all night long he strode knowing not whither through the mysterious streets and squares of london the watchmen to whom his figure was familiar gripped their staves at his approach for they had old reason to fear his wild and riotous habits he did not heed them 
through that dim conflict between darkness and day which is ever waged silently over our sleep lord george strode on in the deep absorption of his love and of his despair at dawn he found himself on the outskirts of a little wood in kensington a rabbit rushed past him through the dew birds were fluttering in the branches the leaves were tremulous with the presage of day and the air was full of the sweet scent of hyacinths how cool the country was it seemed to cool the feverish maladies of his soul and consecrate his love in the fair light of the dawn he began to shape the means of winning jenny mere that he had conceived in the desperate hours of the night soon an old woodman passed by and with rough courtesy showed him the path that would lead him quickest to the town he was loath to leave the wood with jenny he thought he would live always in the country and he picked a posy of wild flowers for her his rentrée into the still silent town strengthened his arcadian resolves he who had seen the town so often in its hours of sleep had never noticed how sinister its whole aspect was in its narrow streets the white houses rose on either side of him like cliffs of chalk he hurried swiftly along the unswept pavement how had he loved this city of evil secrets at last he came to st james's square to the hateful door of his own house shadows lay like memories in every corner of the dim hall through the window of his room a sunbeam slanted across his smooth white bed and fell ghastly on the ashen grate end of chapter one chapter two it was a bright morning in old bond street and fat little mr aeneas the fashionable mask-maker was sunning himself at the door of his shop his window was lined as usual with all kinds of masks beautiful masks with pink cheeks and absurd masks with protuberant chins curious tryptocuratira greek prosopa copied from old tragic models masks of paper for children or fine silk for ladies and of leather for working men bearded or beardless gilded or waxen most of them indeed were waxen big or little masks and in the middle of this vain galaxy hung the presentment of a cyclops face carved cunningly of gold with a great sapphire in its brow the sun gleamed brightly on the window and on the bald head and varnished shoes of fat little mr aeneas it was too early for any customers to come and mr aeneas seemed to be greatly enjoying his leisure in the fresh air he smiled complacently as he stood there and well he might for he was a great artist and was patronized by several crowned heads and not a few of the nobility only the evening before mr brummel had come into his shop and ordered a light summer mask wishing to evade for a time the jealous vigilance of lady otterton it pleased mr aeneas to think that his art made him the recipient of so many high secrets he smiled as he thought of the titled spendthrifts who at this moment perdu behind his masterpieces passed unscathed among their creditors he was the secular confessor of his day always able to give absolution a unique position the street was as quiet as a village street at an open window over the way a handsome lady wrapped in a muslin peignoir sat sipping her cup of chocolate it was la signora gamboji and mr aeneas made her many elaborate bows this morning however her thoughts seemed far away and she did not notice the little man's polite efforts nettled at her negligence mr aeneas was on the point of retiring into his shop when he saw lord george hell hastening up the street with a posy of wild flowers in his hand his lordship is up betimes he said to himself an early visit to la signora i suppose not so however his lordship came straight towards the mask shop 
once he glanced up at signora's window and looked deeply annoyed when he saw her sitting there he came quickly into the shop i want the mask of a saint he said mask of a saint my lord certainly said mr aeneas briskly with or without halo his grace the bishop of st aldred's always wears his with a halo your lordship does not wish for a halo certainly if your lordship will allow me to take his measurement i must have the mask to-day's lord george said have you none ready made ah i see required for immediate wear murmured mr aeneas dubiously you see your lordship takes a rather large size and he looked at the floor julius he cried suddenly to his assistant who was putting the finishing touches to a mask of barbarossa which the young king of zuremburg was to wear at his coronation the following week julius do you remember the saint's mask we made for mr rigsby a couple of years ago oh, yes sir said the boy it's stored upstairs i thought so replied mr aeneas mr ribsky only had it on hire step upstairs julius and bring it down i fancy it is just what your lordship would wish spiritual yet handsome is it a mask that is even as a mirror of true love lord george asked gravely it was made precisely as such the mask-maker answered in fact it was made for mr ribsby to wear at his silver wedding and was very highly praised by the relatives of mrs ribsby will your lordship step into my little room so mr aeneas led the way to his parlour behind the shop he was elated by the distinguished acquisition to his clientele for hitherto lord george had never patronized his business he bustled round his parlour and insisted that his lordship should take a chair and a pinch from his snuff-box while the saint's mask was being found lord george's eye travelled along the rows of framed letters from great personages which lined the walls he did not see them, though, for he was calculating the chances that La Gambogi had not observed him as he entered the mask-shop. He had come down so early that he thought she would still be abed. That sinister old proverb, La jalouse se lève de bonheur, rose in his memory. His eye fell unconsciously on a large round mask made of dull silver, with the features of a human face traced over its surface in faint filigree your lordship wonders what mask that is chirped mr aeneas tapping the thing with one of his little finger-nails what is that mask lord george murmured absently i ought not to divulge my lord said the mask-maker but i know your lordship would respect a professional secret a secret of which i am pardonable proud this he said is a mask for the sun-god apollo whom heaven bless you astound me said lord george of no less a person i do assure you when jupiter his father made him lord of the day apollo craved that he might sometimes see the doings of mankind in the hours of night-time jupiter granted so reasonable a request and when next apollo had passed over the sky and hidden in the sea and darkness had fallen on all of the world he raised his head above the waters that he might watch the doings of mankind in the hours of night-time but mr aeneas added with a smile his bright countenance made light all the darkness men rose from their couches or from their revels wondering that day was so soon come and went to their work and apollo sank weeping into the sea surely he cried it is a bitter thing that i alone of all the gods may not watch the world in the hours of night-time for in those hours as i am told men are even as gods are they spill the wine and are wreathed with roses their daughters dance in the light of torches they laugh to the sound of flutes on their long couches they lie down at last and sleep comes to kiss their eyelids none of these things may i see wherefore the brightness of my beauty is even a curse to me and i would put it from me and as he wept vulcan said to him 
i am not the least cunning of the gods nor the least pitiful do not weep for i will give you that which shall end your sorrow nor need you put from you the brightness of your beauty and vulcan made a mask of dull silver and fastened it across his brother's face and that night thus masked the sun-god rose from the sea and watched the doings of mankind in the night-time nor any longer were men abashed by his bright beauty for it was hidden by the mask of silver those whom he had so often seen haggard over their daily tasks he saw feasting now and wreathed with red roses he heard them laugh to the sound of flutes as their daughters danced in the red light of torches and when at length they lay down upon their soft couches and sleep kissed their eyelids he sank back into the sea and hid his mask under a little rock in the bed of the sea nor have men ever known that apollo watches them often in the night-time but fancied it to be some pale goddess i myself have always thought it was diana said lord george hell an error my lord said mr aeneas with a smile ecce signum and he tapped the mask of dull silver strange said his lordship and pray how comes it that apollo has ordered of you this new mask he has always worn twelve new masks every year inasmuch as no mask can endure for many nights the near brightness of his face before which even a mask of the best and purest silver soon tarnishes and wears away centuries ago vulcan tired of making so very many masks and so apollo sent mercury down to athens to the shop of phoron a phoenician mask-maker of great skill phoron made apollo's masks for many years and every month mercury came to his shop for a new one when phoron died another artist was chosen and when he died another and so on through all the ages of the world conceive my lord my pride and pleasure when mercury flew into my shop one night last year and made me apollo's warrant-holder it is the highest privilege that any mask-maker can desire and when i die said mr aeneas with some emotion mercury will confer my post upon another and do they pay you for your labour lord george asked mr aeneas drew himself up to his full height such as it was in olympus my lord he said they have no currency for any mask-maker so high a privilege is its own reward yet the sun-god is generous he shines more brightly into my shop than into any other nor does he suffer his rays to melt any waxen mask made by me until its wearer doth it and it be done with at this moment julius came in with the ripsby mask i must ask your lordship's pardon for having kept you so long pleaded mr aeneas but i have a large store of old masks and they are imperfectly catalogued it certainly was a beautiful mask with its smooth pink cheeks and devotional brows it was made of the finest wax lord george took it gingerly in his hands and tried it on his face it fitted ah merveilleux is the expression exactly as your lordship would wish asked mr aeneas lord george laid it on the table and studied it intently i wish it were more as a perfect mirror of true love he said at length it is uh, too calm too contemplative easily remedied said mr aeneas selecting a fine pencil he deftly drew the eyebrows closer to each other with a brush steeped in some scarlet pigment he put a fuller curve upon the lips and behold it was the mask of a saint who loves dearly lord george's heart throbbed with pleasure and for how long does your lordship wish to wear it asked mr aeneas i must wear it until i die replied lord george kindly be seated then i pray rejoined the little man for i must apply the mask with great care julius you will assist me so while julius heated the inner side of the waxen mask over a little lamp mr aeneas stood over lord george gently smearing his features with some sweet-scented pomade 
then he took the mask and powdered its inner side quite soft and warm now with a fluffy puff keep quite still for one instant he said and clapped the mask firmly on his lordship's upturned face so soon as he was sure of its perfect adhesion he took from his assistant's hand a silver file and a little wooden spatula with which he proceeded to pare down the edge of the mask where it joined the neck and ears at length all traces of the join were obliterated it remained only to arrange the curls of the lordly wig over the waxen brow the disguise was done when lord george looked through the eyelets of his mask into the mirror that was placed in his hand he saw a face that was saintly itself a mirror of true love how wonderful it was he felt his past was a dream he felt he was a new man indeed his voice went strangely through the mask's parted lips as he thanked mr aeneas proud to have served your lordship said that little worthy pocketing his fee of fifty guineas while he bowed his customer out when he reached the street lord george nearly uttered a curse through those sainted lips of his for there right in his way stood la gambogi with a small pink parasol she laid her hand upon his sleeve and called him softly by his name he passed her by without a word again she confronted him i cannot let go so handsome a lover she laughed even though he spurn me do not spurn me george give me your posy of wild flowers why you never looked so lovingly at me in all your life madam said lord george sternly i have not the honour to know you and he passed on the lady gazed after her lost lover with the blackest hatred in her eyes presently she beckoned across the road to a certain spy and the spy followed him End of chapter two chapter three lord george greatly agitated had turned into piccadilly it was horrible to have met this garish embodiment of his past on the very threshold of his fair future the mask-makers elevating talk about the gods followed by the initiative ceremony of his saintly mask had driven all discordant memories from his love thoughts of jenny mere and then to be met by la gambogi it might be that after his stern words she would not seek to cross his path again surely she would not seek to mar his sacred love yet he knew her dark italian nature her passion of revenge what was the line in virgil spretaque something who knew but that somehow sooner or later she might come between him and his love he was about to pass lord barrymore's mansion count karoloff and mr fitzclarence were lounging in one of the lower windows would they know him behind his mask thank god they did not they merely laughed as he went by and mr fitzclarence cried in a mocking voice sing us a hymn mr whatever your saint's name is the mask then at least was perfect jenny mere would not know him he need fear no one but la gambogi but would not she betray his secret he sighed that night he was going to visit garbles and to declare his love to the little actress he never doubted that she would love him for his saintly face had she not said that man whose face is wonderful as are the faces of the saints to him i will give my true love she could not say now that his face was as a tarnished mirror of love she would smile on him she would be his bride but would la gambogi be at garbles the operetta would not be over before ten that night the clock in hyde park gate told him it was not yet ten ten of the morning twelve whole hours to wait before he could fall at jenny's feet i cannot spend that time in this place of memories he thought so he hailed a yellow cabriolet and bade the jarvet drive him out to the village of kensington 
when they came to the little wood where he had been but a few hours ago lord george dismissed the jarvey the sun that had risen as he stood there thinking of jenny shone down on his altered face but though it shone very fiercely it did not melt his waxen features the old woodman who had shown him his way passed by under a load of faggots and did not know him he wandered among the trees it was a lovely wood presently he came to the bank of that tiny stream the ken which still flowed there in those days on the moss of its bank he lay down and let its waters ripple over his hand some bright pebble glistened under the surface and as he peered down at it he saw in the stream the reflection of his mask a great shame filled him that he should so cheat the girl he loved behind that fair mask there would still be the evil face that had repelled her could he be so base as to decoy her into love of that most ingenious deception he was filled with a great pity for her with a hatred of himself and yet he argued was the mask indeed a mean trick surely it was a secret symbol of his true repentance and of his true love his face was evil because his life had been evil he had seen a gracious girl and of a sudden his very soul had changed his face alone was the same as it had been it was not just that his face should be evil still there was the faint sound of some one sighing lord george looked up and there on the further bank stood jenny mere watching him as their eyes met she blushed and hung her head she looked like nothing but a tall child as she stood there with her straight limp frock of lilac cotton and her sunburnt straw bonnet he dared not speak he could only gaze at her suddenly there perched astride the bough of a tree at her side that winged and laughing child in whose hand was a bow before lord george could warn her an arrow had flashed down and vanished in her heart and cupid had flown away no cry of pain did she utter but stretched out her arms to her lover with a glad smile he leapt quite lightly over the little stream and knelt at her feet it seemed more fitting that he should kneel before the gracious thing he was unworthy of but she knowing only that his face was as the face of a great saint bent over him and touched him with her hand surely she said you are that good man for whom i have waited therefore do not kneel to me but rise and suffer me to kiss your hand for my love of you is lowly and my heart is all yours but he answered looking up into her fond eyes nay you are a queen and i must needs kneel in your presence but she shook her head wistfully and she knelt down also in her tremulous ecstasy before him and as they knelt the one to the other the tears came into her eyes and he kissed her though the lips that he pressed to her lips were only waxen he thrilled with happiness in that mimic kiss he held her close to him in his arms and they were silent in the sacredness of their love from his breast he took the posy of wild flowers that he had gathered they are for you he whispered i gathered them for you hours ago in the wood see they are not withered but she was perplexed by his words and said to him blushing how was it for me that you gathered them though you had never seen me i gathered them for you he answered knowing i should soon see you how was it that you who had never seen me yet waited for me i waited knowing i should see you at last and she kissed the posy and put it at her breast and they rose from their knees and went into the wood walking hand in hand as they went he asked the names of the flowers that grew under their feet they are primroses she would say did you not know and these are ladies feet and these forget-me-nots and that white flower climbing up the trunks of the trees and trailing down so prettily from the branches is called astinex these little yellow things are buttercups did you not know and she laughed i know the names of none of the flowers he said she looked up into his face and said timidly 
is it worldly and wrong of me to have loved the flowers ought i to have thought more of those higher things that are unseen his heart smote him he could not answer her simplicity surely the flowers are good and did you not gather this posy for me she pleaded but if you do not love them i must not and i will try to forget their names for i must try to be like you in all things love the flowers always he said and teach me to love them so she told him all about the flowers how some grew very slowly and others bloomed in a night how clever the convolvulus was at climbing and how shy violets were and why honeycups had folded petals she told him of the birds too that sang in the wood how she knew them all by their voices that is a chaffinch singing listen she said and she tried to imitate its note that her lover might remember all the birds according to her were good except the cuckoo and whenever she heard him sing she would stop her ears lest she should forgive him for robbing the nests every day she said i have come to the wood because i was lonely and it seemed to pity me but now i have you and it is glad she clung closer to his arm and he kissed her she pushed back her straw bonnet so that it dangled from her neck by its ribbons and laid her little head against his shoulder for a while he forgot his treachery to her thinking only of his love and her love suddenly she said to him will you try not to be angry with me if i tell you something it is something that will seem dreadful to you povretta he answered you cannot have anything very dreadful to tell i am very poor she said and every night i dance in a theatre it is the only thing i can do to earn my bread do you despise me because i dance she looked up shyly at him and saw that his face was full of love for her and not angry do you like dancing he asked i hate it she answered quickly i hate it indeed yet to-night alas i must dance again in the theatre you need never dance again said her lover i am rich and i will pay them to release you you shall dance only for me sweetheart it cannot be much more than noon let us go into the town while there is time and you shall be made my bride and i your bridegroom this very day why should you and i be lonely i do not know she said so they walked back through the wood taking a narrow path which jenny said would lead them quickest to the village and as they went they came to a tiny cottage with a garden that was full of flowers the old woodman was leaning over its paling and he nodded to them as they passed i often used to envy the woodman said jenny living in that dear little cottage let us live there then said lord george and he went back and asked the old man if he were not unhappy living there alone tis a poor life here for me the old man answered no folk come to the wood except little children now and again to play or lovers like you but they seldom notice me and in winter i am alone with jack frost old men love merrier company than that oh i shall die in the snow with my faggots on my back a poor life here i will give you gold for your cottage and whatever is in it and then you can go and live happily in the town lord george said and he took from his coat a note for two hundred guineas and held it across the palings lovers are poor foolish dairy docks the old man muttered but i thank you kindly sir this little sum will keep me cosy as long as i last come into the cottage as soon as can be it's a lonely place and does my heart good to depart from it we are going to be married this afternoon in the town said lord george we will come straight back to our home may you be happy replied the woodman you'll find me gone when you come and the lovers thanked him and went their way are you very rich jenny asked ought you to have bought the cottage for that great price would you love me as much if i were quite poor little jenny he asked her after a pause i did not know you were rich when i saw you across the stream she said and in his heart lord george made a good resolve 
he would put away from him all his worldly possessions all the money that he had won at the clubs fairly or foully all that hideous accretion of gold guineas he would distribute among the comrades he had impoverished as he walked with the sweet and trustful girl at his side the vague record of his infamy assailed him and a look of pain shot behind his smooth mask he would atone he would shun no sacrifice that might cleanse his soul all his fortune he would put from him follard chase he would give back to sir follard he would sell his house in st james square he would keep some little part of his patrimony enough for him in the wood with jenny but no more i shall be quite poor jenny he said and they talked of the things that lovers love to talk of how happy they would be together and how economical as they were passing herbert's pastry shop which as my little readers know still stands in kensington jenny looked up rather wistfully into her lover's ascetic face should you think me greedy she asked him if i wanted a bun they have beautiful buns here buns the simple word started latent memories of his childhood jenny was only a child after all buns he had forgotten what they were like and as they looked at the pile of variegated cakes in the window he said to her which are buns jenny i should like to have one too i am almost afraid of you she said you must despise me so are you so good that you deny yourself all the vanity and pleasure that most people love it is wonderful not to know what buns are the round brown shiny cakes with little raisins in them are buns so he bought two beautiful buns and they sat together in the shop eating them jenny bit hers rather diffidently but was reassured when he said that they must have buns very often in the cottage yes he the famous toper and gourmet of st james's relished this homely fare as it passed through the insensible lips of his mask to the palate he seemed to rise from the consumption of his bun a better man but there was no time to lose now it was already past two o'clock so he got a chaise from the inn opposite the pastry shop and they were swiftly driven to doctor's commons there he purchased a special license when the clerk asked him to write his name upon it he hesitated what name should he assume under a mask he had wooed this girl under an unreal name he must make her his bride he loathed himself for a trickster he had vilely stolen from her the love she would not give him even now should he not confess himself the man whose face had frightened her and go his way and yet surely it was not just that he whose soul was transfigured should bear his old name surely george hell was dead and his name had died with him so he dipped a pen in the ink and wrote george heaven for want of a better name and jenny wrote jenny mere beneath it an hour later they were married according to the simple rites of a dear little registry office in covent garden and in the cool evening they went home. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 In the cottage that had been the woodman's they had a wonderful honeymoon. No king and queen in any palace of gold were happier than they. For them their tiny cottage was a palace, and the flowers that filled the gardens were their courtiers long and careless and full of kisses were the days of their reign sometimes indeed strange dreams troubled lord george's sleep once he dreamed that he stood knocking and knocking at the great door of a castle it was a bitter night the frost enveloped him no one came presently he heard a step in the hall beyond and a pair of frightened eyes peered at him through the grill jenny was scanning his face she would not open to him with tears and wild words he besought her but she would not open to him then very stealthily he crept round the castle and found a small casement in the wall it was open he climbed swiftly quietly through it in the darkness of the room some one ran to him and kissed him gladly it was jenny 
with a cry of joy and shame he awoke by his side lay jenny sleeping like a little child after all what was a dream to him it could not mar the reality of his daily happiness he cherished his true penitence for the evil he had done in the past the past that was indeed the only unreal thing that lingered in his life every day its substance dwindled grew fainter yet as he lived his rustic honeymoon had he not utterly put it from him had he not a few hours after his marriage written to his lawyer declaring solemnly that he lord george hell had forsworn the world that he was where no man would find him that he desired all his worldly goods to be distributed thus and thus among these and those of his companions by this testament he had verily atoned for the wrong he had done had made himself dead indeed to the world no address had he written upon this document though its injunctions were final and binding it would betray no clue of his hiding-place for the rest no one would care to seek him out he who had done no good to human creature would pass unmourned out of memory the clubs doubtless would laugh and puzzle over his strange recantations envious of whomever he had enriched they would say twas a good riddance of a rogue and soon forget him but she whose prime patron he had been who had loved him in her vile fashion la gamboji would she forget him easily like the rest as the sweet days went by her spectre also grew fainter and less formidable she knew his mask indeed but how should she find him in the cottage near kensington dewia doceto latabrarum he was safe hidden with his bride as for the italian she might search and search or had forgotten him in the arms of another lover yes few and faint became the blemishes of his honeymoon at first he had felt that his waxen mask though it had been the means of his happiness was rather a barrier betwixt him and his bride though it was sweet to kiss her through it to look at her through it with loving eyes yet there were times when it incommoded him with its mockery could he put it from him yet that of course could not be he must wear it all his life and so as days went by he grew reconciled to his mask no longer did he feel it jarring on his face it seemed to become a very part of him and for all its rigid material it did forsooth express the one emotion that filled him true love the face for whose sake jenny gave him her heart could not but be dear to this george heaven also every day chastened him with its joy they lived a very simple life he and jenny they rose betimes like the birds for whose goodness they both had so sincere a love bread and honey and little strawberries were their morning fare and in the evening they had seed cake and dewberry wine jenny herself made the wine and her husband drank it in strict moderation never more than two glasses he thought it tasted far better than the regent's sherry brandy or the tokay at brooks of these treasured topes he had indeed nearly forgotten the taste the wine made from wild berries by his little bride was august enough for his palate sometimes after they had dined thus he would play the flute to her upon the moonlit lawn or tell her of the great daisy chain he was going to make for her on the morrow or sit quietly by her side listening to the nightingale till bedtime so admirably simple were their days end of chapter four chapter five one morning as he was helping jenny to water the flowers he said to her suddenly sweetheart we had forgotten what was there we should forget asked jenny looking up from her task tis the mensiversary of our wedding her husband answered gravely we must not let it pass without some celebration no indeed she said we must not what shall we do between them they decided upon an unusual feast they would go into the village and buy a bag of beautiful buns and eat them in the afternoon 
so soon then as all the flowers were watered they set forth to herbert's shop bought the buns and returned home in very high spirits george bearing a paper bag that held no less than twelve of the wholesome delicacies under the plane tree on the lawn jenny sat her down and george stretched himself at her feet they were loath to enjoy their feast too soon they dallied in childish anticipation on a little rustic table jenny built up the buns one above another till they looked like a tall pagoda when very gingerly she had crowned the structure with the twelfth bun her husband looked on with admiration she clapped her hands and danced about it she laughed so loudly for though she was only sixteen years old she had a great sense of humour that the table shook and alas the pagoda tottered and fell to the lawn swift as a kitten jenny chased the buns as they rolled hither and thither over the grass catching them deftly with her hand then she came back flushed and merry under her tumbled hair with her arm full of buns she began to put them in the paper bag dear husband she said looking down to him why do not you too smile at my folly your grave face rebukes me smile or i shall think i vex you please smile a little but the mask could not smile of course it was made for a mirror of true love and it was grave and immobile i am very much amused dear he said at the fall of the buns but my lips will not curve to a smile love of you has bound them in spell but i can laugh though i love you i do not understand and she wondered he took her hand in his and stroked it gently wishing it were possible to smile some day perhaps she would tire of this monotonous gravity this rigid sweetness it was not strange that she should long for a little facial expression they sat silently jenny what is it he whispered suddenly for jenny with wide open eyes was gazing over his head across the lawn why do you look frightened there is a strange woman smiling at me across the palings she said i do not know her her husband's heart sank somehow he dared not turn his head to the intruder she is nodding to me said jenny i think she is foreign for she has an evil face do not notice her he whispered does she look evil very evil and very dark she has a pink parasol her teeth are like ivory do not notice her think it is the mensiversary of our wedding dear i wish she would not smile at me her eyes are like bright blots of ink let us eat our beautiful buns oh she is coming in george heard the latch of the gate jar forbid her to come in whispered jenny i am afraid he heard the jar of heels on the gravel path yet he dared not turn only he clasped jenny's hand more tightly as he waited for the voice it was la gambogis pray pray pardon me I, I could not mistake the back of so old a friend with the courage of despair george turned and faced the woman even she smiled though his face has changed uh, marvellously madam he said rising to his full height and stepping between her and his bride begone i command you from this garden i do not see what good is to be served by the renewal of our acquaintance acquaintance murmured la gambogi with an arch of her beetle brows surely we were friends rather nor is my esteem for you so dead that i would crave estrangement madam rejoined lord george with a tremor in his voice you see me happy living very peacefully with my bride to whom i beseech you old friend present me i would not he said hotly desecrate her sweet name by speaking it with so infamous a name as yours your choler hurts me old friend said la gambogi sinking composedly upon the garden seat and smoothing the silk of her skirts jenny said george then do you retire pending this lady's departure to the cottage but jenny clung to his arm i were less frightened at your side she whispered do not send me away 
suffer her pretty presence said la gambogi indeed i am come this long way from the heart of the town that i may see her no less than you george my wish is only to befriend her why should she not set you a mannerly example giving me welcome come and sit by me little bride for i have things to tell you though you reject my friendship give me at least the slight courtesy of audience i will not detain you over long will be gone very soon are you expecting guests george on dirait une masque champêtre she eyed the couple critically your wife's mask she said is even better than yours what does she mean whispered jenny oh send her away serpent was all george could say crawl from our eden ere you poison with your venom its fairest denizen la gambogi rose even my pride she cried passionately knows certain bounds i have been forbearing but even in my zeal for friendship i will not be called serpent i will indeed be gone from this rude place yet ere i go there is a boon i will deign to beg show me oh show me but once more the dear face i have so often caressed the lips that were dear to me george started back what does she mean whispered jenny in memory of our old uh, friendship continued la gambogi grant me this piteous favour show me your own face but for one instant and i vow that i will never again remind you that i live intercede for me little bride bid him unmask for me you have more authority over him than i doff his mask with your own uxorious fingers what does she mean was the refrain of poor jenny if said george gazing sternly at his traitress you do not go now of your own will i must drive you man though i am violently from the garden doff your mask and uh, i'm gone george made a step of menace towards her false saint she shrieked then i will unmask you like a panther she sprang upon him and clawed at his waxen cheeks jenny fell back mute with terror vainly did george try to free himself from his assailant who writhed round and round him clawing clawing at what jenny fancied to be his face with a wild cry jenny fell upon the furious creature and tried with all her childish strength to release her dear one the combative swayed to and fro a revulsive trinity there was a loud pop as though some great cork had been withdrawn, and La Gambogi recoiled. She had torn away the mask. It lay before her upon the lawn, upturned to the sky. George stood motionless. La Gambogi stared up into his face, and her dark flush died swiftly away. For there, staring back at her, was the man she had unmasked. But, lo, his face was even as his mask had been line for line feature for feature it was the same twas a saint's face madam he said in the calm voice of despair your cheek may well blanch when you regard the ruin you have brought upon me nevertheless do i pardon you the gods have avenged through you the imposture i have wrought upon one who was dear to me for that unpardonable sin i am punished as for my poor bride whose love i stole by the means of that waxen semblance of her i cannot ask pardon o oh, jenny jenny do not look at me turn your eyes from the foul reality that i dissembled he shuddered and hid his face in his hands do not look at me i will go from the garden nor will i ever curse you with the odious spectacle of my face forget me forget me but as he turned to go jenny laid her hands upon his wrists and besought him that he would look at her for indeed she said i am bewildered by your strange words why did you woo me under a mask and why do you imagine i could love you less dearly seeing your own face he looked into her eyes on their violet surface he saw the tiny reflection of his own face he was filled with joy and wonder 
surely said jenny your face is even dearer to me even fairer than the semblance that hid it and deceived me i am not angry twas well that you veiled from me the full glory of your face for indeed i was not worthy to behold it too soon but i am your wife now let me look always at your own face let the time of my probation be over kiss me with your own lips so he took her in his arms as though she had been a little child and kissed her with his own lips she put her arms round his neck and he was happier than he had ever been they were alone in the garden now nor lay the mask any longer upon the lawn for the sun had melted it end of chapter 5 end of the happy hypocrite by max beerbohm